gentleman. I am indeed a curator in the British Museum, and it's very seldom that I allow it to be announced in public, because when people find this out, they tend to move away automatically. <laughs> well, this is George Smith, and in 1872, he was the curator in the British Museum who for the first time discovered that cuneiform inscriptions from ancient Iraq, from Assyria in fact, which had recently arrived in the British Museum following excavation, included among them an account of the flood which echoed and paralleled the account in the book of Genesis in a very disconcerting way. Now Smith, you will see, is intellectually gifted, bearded, handsome, <laughs> a leader among men, and I just wanted to point out that the trustees have in no way changed their policy in appointing people who come afterwards. Now, when Smith made this discovery, it was broadcast very rapidly, and clergymen all over Britain motored to the coast and looked longingly over the cliffs because they were unable to accept the fact that what they regarded as holy writ should occur on large pieces of broken Weetabix. <laughs> and in fact, the impact of this discovery was really uh, something that everybody understood, because in the 19th century, everybody read their Bible, they knew their Genesis well, and the parallel between the Assyrian version and uh, the one they knew from the Bible was very close. So after God decided to eliminate the world, the secret was leaked to Noah, who built the ark for the animals, and life survived the waters so that it could continue afterwards. And not only the outline plot, but specific details, among which the most lucid was that when the waters were finished, Noah opened a window and released a sequence of three birds, and on the third occasion, when it didn't come back, he knew that trees must have appeared above the water, and they were nearly safe. So, this was a very interesting thing, and I can tell you something perfectly straightforwardly, that ever since 1872, nobody has ever come up with a rational explanation to account for the fact that this Weetabix thing and the Bible are so closely paralleled. The parallel is one of literary dependency. And anybody who knows anything about literature will see, if you read the English and the Babylonian side by side, there can be no question they are closely related from a literary point of view. So, Smith published his translation, and you can see that uh, the quotation I put up, part of his story, was that the boat you're going to build, her dimensions should all correspond, her breadth and length should be the same, cover her with a roof like the Apsu, which is the water under the world. One acre was her circle, ten rods each, her sides stood high, ten rods each, the edges of her top were equal. This is a literal translation of the text that Smith found in the BM, and that was written in the 7th century BC. It was part of the library of Ashurbanipal at Nineveh. And it was not that far away in time from the biblical period. And so there was a lot of anxiety. Which came first, the Bible or the barbarians who influenced whom? Now, the text of Gilgamesh, as translated recently by Andrew George, is a very wonderful new edition of it, produces a boat which is square in plan, and with many stories, it looks like a block of flats. And quite frankly, it's a fat lot of good as a boat. <laughs> then we have the well-known thing in the book of Genesis, and it says... In the Hebrew, so make yourself an ark out of cypress wood, make rooms in it, cover it with tar inside and out, and here is how I want you to build it. The ark has to be 450 feet long, it has to be 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it, leave the sides of the ark open a foot and a half from the top, put a door in one side of the ark, make lower, middle and upper decks. Quite useful instructions, and this is the sort of thing that lunatics all over the face of the world are often building on the back of it. So, we have the Gilgamesh, 7th century BC, the thing in the Old Testament. Then something happened to me personally, long after Smith was dead and buried in the same building, virtually in the same room, when this cuneiform tablet came into the British Museum. Now, if you're a curator in that institution, one of the delights and also one of the pains in the neck is that you can be on duty because people all over Britain 
bring questions and objects to the museum under the mistaken impression that the building is staffed by experts. Where this <laughs> idea comes from, I have no idea. I have absolutely no expertise in anything. I happen to be able to read cuneiform writing, and the languages involved are Sumerian and Babylonian. They've all be, both been extinct for at least 2,000 years, and they are the kind of thing that the government considers a waste of money. <laughs> so when I saw this tablet for the first time, it was among a whole group of other small objects, like a few lamps and some coins, a bit of this and a bit of that, a kind of normal, low-level collection of antiquities. I saw this thing and I thought straight away it must be a letter because that is what Babylonian letters look like. And um, so I started to read the first four lines, which I managed to read very quickly because they turned out to be very famous, and this is what they said. Wall, wall, read wall, read wall. Atrahasis, pay heed to my advice that you may live forever. Destroy your house, build a boat, spurn property, and save life. Well, that sure as hell ain't no normal letter. And in point of fact, it, it's obvious to me, because I'd been through the usual ropes, that this was part of this same flood story. And the thing was, it comes from a very dramatic moment, because in Parliament, the Babylonian gods have decided to obliterate the world because human beings are so noisy. That is the main reason for it. And the god Enki, who doesn't think this is a good idea, leaks the information to this Atram Harsis, a human being whose name means very wise, and told him in no uncertain terms to drop everything and build a boat. So I was full of excitement because here was a new piece of this famous thing that everybody was interested in, and on top of it all, it was about a thousand years older than the one from Nineveh, because the script and the language and the grammar and the forms of the verbs make it certain it was written in about 1750 BC, around the time of Hammurabi the lawgiver, and a millennium older than the famous version from Smith. So I thought to myself, this is fantastic, a brand new piece of the flood story, old as anything, and not even a single Assyriologist has ever seen it before. This is really exciting. And what he did, this fellow, was to put it back in the bag, ask me a few other questions about the other pieces, and off he went. And at that time, the trustees of the museum had failed to distribute the instruction manual about how to fell a member of the public to the ground. <laughs> and seize their property for the national collection. So it, it was some, uh, some years before I saw this tablet again, but finally it came under my control. And it turned out to be a bar of gold, and it was full of the most unexpected things. So when I got it, I shut the door, I turned on my lamp, and I got down to reading it. The front, as you can see, it has the best part of 30 lines, reading left to right, pressed into the clay, all the way down the front, is not so terrible. You turn it over, the back looks like it's a dance floor for drunk rhinoceroses. <laughs> and the fact is in the seriology that the more interesting the text is, the more broken it always turns out to be. <laughs> so I have this text to myself and I start reading beyond the, f the important lines. Now, the thing is, this Enki, this god Enki, why ever he chose the Babylonian Noah, I don't know, because he didn't trust him. Because he had to tell him every detail about the boat he was to build. And the first two-thirds of that front are something like the sort of thing you get on a box when you go to Ikea <laughs> with a list of things. You want to build an ark? This is what you've got to have. And so the first thing he lays out on the table is the shape of the ark. Well, I mean, you know about the Gilgamesh nonsense, you know about the Old Testament view. Of course, everybody really knows what Noah's ark looks like. It's a kind of watermelon with a little house in the top, a ladder, and a giraffe looking out the window. <laughs> so I was a little taken aback to discover, reading down this thing, that the description was unambiguous that it was to be round. It was to be a round craft. And it, not only does it tell you the shape, it tells you the size, the materials that you need to build it, how much you need of them, and get on with it. So it is very fascinating. So um, for those of you who 
are interested in such boring things as numbers, all these numbers are espoused and clearly demonstrated in the cheap back paperback which is available at the back of the room for home consumption, and I recommend that to you. <laughs> I will tell you the main things about this which make it so remarkable. Firstly, round boats existed in Mesopotamia because they had on the, the rivers, Euphrates and Tigris, as a regular kind of water service, these round coracles or guffers as they are called in Arabic, and we know that they existed in antiquity. We can document them spasmodically through up until the 20th century AD. And they represent a kind of craft that once invented never went away. So this is an old photograph from about 1920 of some chaps, guffer G's, on the bank of the Euphrates building a guffer. And you can see that roughly the shape of the thing, and what you do when you build one of these things is you lay the rope you have to twist the rope firstly, and this is all covered in the cuneiform inscription. You get the pith of a palm tree and you twist it into rope, and it's laid out in a great circle of the right size, which is 3,600 square meters. And then when you've done that, as it comes round to the beginning point, you lay it on top this all over again and then on top each time, and as it's done, the various strands of the wall are lashed together north to south so you end up with a giant floppy basket made of this material and the next step in the tablet is that ribs are cut which go from the top on the inside follow the profile down and these great ribs interlock at the base to make a kind of deck and once you've done that the thing is bitumen from floor to ceiling or rather as it were from floor or inside and out thickly with bitumen which dries hard and waterproofs it, and there you have your boat. And the tablet tells you, moreover, that there was a deck. There had to be a deck. Obviously, the animals were underneath. There was a little house on the top, and there was a roof, the profile of which matched the base of the thing. So that when the ark in the Babylonian conception was ready, it looked a bit like a walnut floating in the sea with this kernel of life inside. Now, the thing is, Enki as I say, it felt necessary to explain exactly all the details. So he told him how much rope he would need. Now, hold on a minute. I have this crucial fact here. So Enki says, you will need to build this boat 14,430 sutu of rope. Hello? Jeez, you were supposed to go gasp or something like that. <laughs> okay, if you put 14,430 sutu into English measurements and you have a piece of rope that long, in a straight line it would go from London to Edinburgh. We know 3,600 square meters is the base of the craft. We know the walls are seven meters high. We also know that the material to make the walls was a finger thick. All this data is carefully presented to us. So it struck me, even though I have a Neanderthal level of mathematics, that there was some stuff here that could be experimented with. So I looked in the yellow pages for um, um, Nobel Prize mathematicians, and um, I got a cheap one. He came over, and I said, if you've got this shape with these statistics made out of a rope this thick, I want you to work out for me, from scratch, how much, what the length of the rope would be, okay? And he did, and um, he did it. It took quite a while, and he checked it about 400 times, and he did it in Babylonian measures. So you will recall, probably, that the first measure from heaven to earth, it was 14,430 sutus of rope. If you do it from scratch in England, using Babylonian systems, you end up with a requirement of 14,624 sutu of rope. In other words, the figure is less than 1% out. Or the real rope you would need would go from Watford to Edinburgh. <laughs> now, this is an interesting thing. And slightly amusing, but the fact is, 
it indicates something remarkable, that all the dimensions and all the materials worked out for this cosmic scale craft were done on the basis of realia. In other words, they took the material, which the measurements and so forth, which applied to making a normal coracle, which is big enough for two people and a, and a sheep, um, and they blew it up in every direction, and it made sense. So we had something which, as it were, if you wanted to build one, you could use. Now, I can't talk to you for the seven and a half hours I would like to. So I'm going to just briefly say something about this. Because um, this is a thing that appeared in the Guardian newspaper written by Maeve Kennedy. And Maeve Kennedy is one of those rare journalists in the world who really likes the British Museum instead of pretends to. And she rang me up and said, Earth, it's Maeve which is the way we generally begin our conversations, and it goes on like that for a while, but the gist of it was, what was new in the tablet business? And I explained nothing particular, I just had this recipe to build the ark a thousand years before it was ever known before, and they're quite an interesting thing, you know, come in, we'll have a chat, and this came out in the newspaper, and two things happened. Firstly, a whole cycle of individuals, mostly Americans, telephoned me in the museum, saying, we got to do a documentary. Now, the thing about... Um, documentary makers, as we've been trained from cradle by the same trustees of the museum, with the understanding that all documentary makers are liars. So we always repel them and never, ever sign up. Because if you do something with them, especially if it's about the Bible, they miss out words when they film you, words like not. <laughs> So, in a polite kind of way, I said, well, bugger off. And then um, a chap called Dan Chambers, who worked once for Channel 4 and had his own documentary company, he came to see me. And we had a talk, and he was a very interesting person. I mean, he could read on his own and everything like that. So it was, it was a whole different animal. And I had this idea that, you know what we could do? I said, we could make a documentary together that tells the truth. And, and Dan went, heck, like that, and smacked his head. He said, no one's ever thought of that before. What an interesting scheme. And we had the plan that there'd be no breaks for urine or coffee, and we wouldn't tell people what we just told them, what we are telling them, and what we're going to tell them next. And did they like it? OK, that was the plan. <laughs> so the upshot was, we have to build this thing, and to cut a very long story short, it would end up being built in India. And it was built in Kerala, on the banks of a a lake in a small boatyard, because um, the materials, the bitumen, the reeds, the rope, the wood, and everything else were available. There was a whole team of people who could do it, and it looked a bit like Iraq. So they got the best ancient boat builders in the world, a guy called Tom Vosmer and his um, sidekicks, and they looked at my translation, and they all spent a couple of days in hospital. Um, <laughs> at the idea of building something which was half the length of a football pitch on this basis. And they, they did some rapid computer work and they discovered that if they built this thing at full size according to the dimensions in this tablet, the ark, which would be so huge, couldn't sustain its own weight, partly because the ribs, which were very long, would have to be splinted and splinted and splinted. And secondly, the bitumen is incredibly heavy and it just, just wouldn't, as it were, function. So we made a compromise and they, they reckoned that with the resources and the this and the that, they could do it for about a third of the size, so they did. So I've got some nice pictures for five seconds so you can see what's going on here. These are the guys making the rope that goes round like this. And they decided, building this boat, because the, the basket was going to be such a huge floppy affair, that they couldn't possibly do that um, before the ribs, because no one could deal with it. They'd all get suffocated. So they decided they would make the ribs first out of wood, on a kind of structure, and then they would start from the bottom and they'd make the, the wrap around that eventually formed the walls. It would all be laced together and covered in black stuff. So we had a great team of workmen, for example. That. <laughs> and here they are doing the marvelous job of everything by hand. There was no glue, there were no nails, nothing like that. It was all done with um, basic tools. And the workmen were fantastic. There were about 40 of them, and they'd all worked together on things not quite of this level of madness, but other things before, so it was all right. Now, I'll just show you one picture, because this is what it looked like when it was actually being built. And this is a living manifestation of the stuff in that tablet. It is brought to life the other side of the world. There's me having coffee in my room and yawning in the museum. 
and these poor blokes in the sun working like bilio, and this is the production. So you, we can see here, perhaps, that um, firstly, the... Oh, I think we have a, an educationalist's aid here. These are the ribs. So they go all the way up to the top of the boat, and then they meet in the middle to make the floor. And then they put these wooden things round, they had a special name, I've forgotten what it is, on top of those, and then the stanchions rested on those which supported the material for the upper floor. So this was the session for the animals, and the one above was for the human beings. Now, um, you know something interesting in the British Museum? When you are on duty, people come in with things, and they, they ask what they are, how old they are, and you give them a learned answer, sometimes with a reference to a German publication, to be really impressive. And they sit there nodding and making notes in a notebook, but actually they don't give a fuck, because <laughs> what they want to know is how much is it worth. Okay. <laughs> I only realised this after about 30 years in the museum trade. Now, the same thing is this. You go into the um, Noah's Ark principle as a lifestyle, and people are really interested in the whole thing, but what people really want to know is, what did they do with the dung? Okay, this is the most important question for people from bishops down. And the fact is, it's not mentioned in the tablet. <laughs> Very probably, um, if, for example you step over the secure barrier between sanity and insanity, and you ask yourself, well, if they had animals on there, what would have happened to them? My answer is that these stanchions would have allowed the setting in of things made of bamboo, and the animals could have been directed so that carnivores weren't next to tasty meals and all sorts of things like that, and it would have worked for a while. That was my argument, but that's a whole other lecture. Now... These are the chaps. These are the marvellous chaps who worked. One team was on bitumen, and we wanted to get this bitumen from Iraq. The Iraqi government regards bitumen as a national treasure. It stinks, it's black, it's heavy, and it's highly carcinogenic, but it's a national treasure. So we couldn't get a test tube of bitumen from the Iraqis. So the consequence was they had to buy it on the black market in India. And that was a really bad move because it was crappy bitumen. It didn't go hard. It didn't fit. It didn't stick. It, didn't, it came off. It was terrible. So I'm telling you straight, you ever build a thing like this in India, don't settle for local black market bitumen. Remember. <laughs> now, I love these guys. There were about 40 of them. Half of them were Muslim and half were Hindu. And they'd worked with the team on building boats, both in India and Oman, for years. So they had a tremendous brotherly thing. They all had their specialism. They worked like Billy. I loved them. But when I got there, when I set foot there eventually for the launch, they were incredibly friendly to me, really effusive and warm and, and everything. And um, you know, I'm used to being a social hit, generally speaking, but this was a little bit surprising. And when the boat was actually launched, it then became necessary for me to be photographed with every one of these guys one by one. So the first one was like this, and then there was one like that, and it went on and on and on, and they all did it. And when we were on the plane going home, I said to one of the film people, I was a bit taken aback by that, you know, all that stuff and everything. And he said, I don't see why. He said, they, they all thought you were descended from Noah. <laughs> So this is, the, this is the upper deck. You can see the top of the ribs and the thing around the top. The, these are the great geniuses who um, did all the planning and working. This is Tom Vosmer, and this is Alessandro Guidoni, and this is Eric Staples. The three of them are amazing, and it's because of them that it happened. So I mustn't get bogged down in this, because I want to talk to you about something else. But this is what the thing looked like when it was floating. Um, there was a lot of fuss in the media about about leaks. I thought that was incredibly small-minded. You know, I have this blueprint, 4,000 years old, to build a boat, we build a boat, and there's a little water on board, and they're all whining about it. My view was this. You ever been in a rowing boat? You ever have dry feet in a rowing boat? Exactly. So a little bit of water, I thought, was perfectly reasonable, and they made a whole lot of fuss about it, and quite frankly, they gave the impression that the whole thing was a fluke that it worked. Well, you can't see, but round the back of this, photograph, there are two bizarre Bronze Age craft with pumps going in behind the house, 
pumping like bilio because the water was beginning to come in and actually it was a bit alarming at one stage but it stabilised. But the reason was it was this bitumen because if we'd had Iraqi stuff we could have gone into America in that boat there'd have been no trouble. Now the reason I want you to look at this is just to confess to you that this is a 1920s photograph of two English ladies in a coracle in Iraq which is about the same scale as this. This is a third of the size of the original and it's certainly the world's biggest coracle. And it's a masterpiece. And that's the little house. And, of course, the Babylonian one, don't forget, had a roof on top. So that's that. That's what it looked like from above, if you are a pterodactyl. And this is what it looked like at the end of all the filming when we had to moor it by the side of a canal and in standard British style, I was the last man off. <laughs> so that boat is still there. Now, there's a horrible measly, mean and nasty idea which came into my mind when I got these photographs because this looks now exactly like a conventional Noah's Ark, doesn't it? Profile, little house, everything. Even though there should be a roof, Babylonian terms, um, it is a bit horribly like a Noah's Ark. And when we were coming up the canal, all these tourists in their tourist boats, three quarters out on the basis of gins and tonic in the sunlight, all jerked awake and they all shouted out, hey, there's Noah's Ark as we went by. So what a pain in the neck is this? We spend about 10 million quid and four months of work and we make something which comes out like a picture book Noah's Ark after all. So what do we do with that? Well, I had an idea because all the painters who do the Tower of Babel, many major, major painters, based themselves entirely on the book of Genesis because there was no other evidence. And they all have a kind of thing in common, right? So in a way, that's sensible. But hardly any painter who has ever done Noah's Ark did anything based on Genesis. And they all looked something like this. So what if all those people, all that time, thought that the boat was round and they drew it from the side and you'd never know? I mean, is that not a disturbingly uncomfortable but possible idea? Right, we now move to the main thread of the Seating Symposium, as Tom Lehrer once remarked, which is this. I want to explain two more things to you very briefly. Firstly, how it got in the Bible, in my opinion, and secondly, um, what happened to it in the end. So, in 597, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of the world, the biggest man in existence, decides that the Judeans in Jerusalem are a pain in the neck and they need a lesson. So, off they go, and they smash them up, and they take the king to Babylon and begin the Babylonian exile. I put this up just to show you that um, sometimes we have uh, cuneiform inscriptions which dovetail precisely with the Bible without any manipulation whatsoever. They are, this is a native record, a native chronicle of the events which are described in the Bible, in the book of Isaiah um, and the book of Kings, exactly the same stuff. It's marvellous. It's really very interesting. So we have this situation that the Judeans, the rulers, the priests, the families, the intelligentsia, everybody is marched by foot from Jerusalem to Babylon to begin the Babylonian exile. Now, if you read the book of Daniel, I don't know whether any ones of you ever do this, if you read the book of the Daniel, right at the beginning of the book of the Daniel, in other words, chapter 1, verse 2, right at the beginning is this sentence. And none, none, of the, none of the clerics, none of the theologians, none of the people who bore everybody else about the Bible has ever looked at this passage and understood its significance. Nobody has ever done so. Listen. Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites, by which he means the Judeans, from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, Handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning. You see, the same thing applies even in antiquity. Well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. So, that thing in yellow is very significant for the history of world culture, because... The language that they learned there was not Hebrew because they knew it. And it wasn't Aramaic because they knew it. It was Babylonian because that's where they were. And the king took the intelligentsia and put them through college so they would then become a Babylonianized and they would not be troublesome and rebellious in the future. 
So here we have a message which tells you that the most intelligent people in ancient uh, Judea were Babylonians with the best teachers, the best facilities in the capital of the world. This is a very significant point. And the reason I emphasize it is the following. That it, when you, if you look, when you go home at the Babylonian version of Gilgamesh, and the, uh, of the flood story rather, and the one in Genesis, you see how similar they are. If you've never encountered it, it makes you sit up. There are two other stories which everybody knows in the Bible which have Babylonian antecedents. One is that before the flood, everybody lived for thousands and thousands of years. This is in the Bible, before Noah. This is a Babylonian principle. And the other one is about Moses in the bulrushes, because there's a story about King Sargon, who was, whose mother was a whore, was a prostitute. No, a priestess. Which one is it? Priestess. <laughs> now, not that it makes a lot of difference, but his mother was a priestess, and she got knocked up. And she wasn't supposed to have sexual intercourse, so she put the baby in a basket, he went down the river, some gardener found it, and he became king of the world, Sargon the Great. So this is a pre, as it were, version of the thing about Moses and the bulrushes. Now, the thing is this. I'm telling you, the intelligentsia from these immigrant people arrive in Babylonia, and they get taught to read this stuff in the classroom by the best teachers. On the curriculum at that time, the baby in the bulrushes and the giant ages of early rulers and the story of Gilgamesh were on school tablets. They were on school tablets. So in other words, when they'd learned the signs and a bit of language, the things they read in class in this period were the very narratives which we find in the Bible. That, in my view, is not coincidental, but just the opposite because it explains the root whereby literary motifs which serve one context and one range of meaning in the ancient culture could be recycled and restructured in the comp composition of what became our Bible. So, you know, if you go to America, you make a remark like this, everyone is competing to shoot you first. <laughs> but the fact is this, if you ever do read the Bible, if you don't think God wrote the Bible with a typewriter, then you have to assume that it's the human hand involved in it. And when you look for the human hand, it's all over the place. And in my view, there was a shortfall in their local traditions about the beginning of the world and the, well, how, what kind of story um, should account for Moses' death. He can't just be born in Coventry and go to training college. He's got to have some kind of prestigious beginning. So they take these things from the Babylonians, but they have a whole different meaning. So, for example, God decides to... to um, destroy the world because of sin, because of sin. In Babylonia, as I said, it was because of the racket. They were irritated with human beings. They thought they'd stamp on them like a mosquito, and they'd create something more peaceful, they worked harder. God's idea was everything was fine, except they were riddled with sin, so we'll start over again. So the theologians, the Judean philosophers who encountered these narratives, they didn't just put them down as they received them, but they reworked them into what became, in my opinion, the Bible. I mean, the beginning of the Bible. That's another whole lecture done in four seconds. <laughs> then we get to this discovery. <laughs> now, you may think that's amusing. I can tell you it's not the worst suggestion I've ever seen. But it shot me when I found it. Now... <laughs> I have to be careful with our host in the room, but I just want to say one or two things about what happened to the ark. The ark that we built is still moored by the side of the canal in India, and no one quite knows what to do with it. In fact, I want to get it brought to the British Museum and put in the reading room, which is about the same shape. <laughs> and I thought we could um, lock the doors and then pump in some water, and it would float, and then people could pay 50p for a ride on it. So that, that, I thought, was a good working scheme, but they have to take the roof off, and they've just put the roof on, so they're not keen. So the question is, what happened to the ark itself? The fact is that in the British Museum, we have a map which explains all this. It's very remarkable. So on the left is this map, and then there's a computer diagram for those whose Babylonian is a little shaky. Um, and I would draw your attention to the following salient issues. Firstly, this circle encloses the known world. That's to say, the world of the Mesopotamians. 
So they visualized the world as at least a round flat disk. Whether they thought it was a globe, a ball, I don't know, but they knew it was round. And the sea that encircles it is all the way around the periphery of this circle is described as a river of bitter water. So they had the idea that wherever you go, you find water. And that led to this stylized diagram, which of course it's true, if you walk far enough, you always do find water, so that also is not so surprising, but there's more to this than meets the eye. Firstly, this is the Euphrates River, which goes from north to south. This is the Persian Gulf. Here is Babylon. This dot is surely the ziggurat. And these circles dotted around the inside of the, of the big circle are either tribal names or place names. So this is not really a motoring map for going on a holiday in Iraq in a Land Rover. It is more of a cosmic issue because we also see from this diagram that around the periphery of the external waters are eight triangles. And these triangles are, I think, a graphic representation of mountainous areas that as you cross the water around the edge of the world appear above the horizon in those eight directions. So that's quite an interesting thing to speculate about, how it might work. And um, on the front, this stuff here is the remains of a very complicated text which explains what happened to a lot of famous uh, mythological characters in ancient Mesopotamian life. So this was drawn in about 600 BC, um, certainly in the south, probably from Babylon or somewhere near there. Now on the back of the tablet, this is the back of the tablet, there are eight rule sections um, of narrative. Altogether there are eight of them, and then there's the colophon, which gives the name of the scribe and other such information. Now these eight um, descriptions go with the eight triangles on the front. And there are many problems about them. You can see that it's very badly broken and abraded. Even what's left is hard to read. But it's clear that these eight triangles represented a sort of narrative, a bit like Odysseus, that if you went, in, as far as man could ever go, beyond mortal knowledge, into all these different directions, you would encounter marvels when you finally landed. So in one of the islands, the sun never sets. Another one has a tree with jewels on and another one, is that my, I've got five minutes left, or somebody's phone? Oh, that's right. Whew. <laughs> um, uh, where were we? Yes, um, the, the, the problem has always been, if I may just go back a moment, the problem has always been, um, firstly, well, if really, to work out which of those instructions go with which triangle. And there's never been any starting point to sort it out. Now, many years ago, I discovered, by chance, really, um, that this little fragment, which had been in the museum for... I mean, the tablet came in the 1880s, and the fragment came in a box for about 10,000 other pieces. Uh, one of our volunteers uh, thought this was an interesting piece, and I realised it joined on here. So when we got this triangle, which has a bit of inscription, it then became possible to work out which of these... Um, expressions goes with which triangle. That was already quite an important breakthrough. But the most important thing is this. That here, this one, it says, if the adventurer understood, if you cross this water all the way to the other side and you start to climb the mountain, you will see something, it says, whose wooden dot, dot, dot are as thick as a parsec to. That's what's written in the text. Now, this word parsec to in Babylonian is a volume measure. It is not a length or thickness measure, it's a volume measure. So it's a bit bizarre to express something which is as thick as a parsec to. It's like saying as thick as a barrel. You kind of understand it, but it's not very clear. Now the thing is this. This is the tablet. It's a replica of the tablet. Anybody who wants to see it afterwards can, if you want to see if you can improve my readings or something, I've got it here. In this tablet, in this very same tablet, the god Enki, having given the instructions, at Rahasis, every time something is done, he says, I've done what you asked. And when it came to the ribs, when the ribs were cut, 
and finished. He said, I cut the ribs as thick as a parsictu in this tablet. And this expression occurs nowhere else in Babylonian literature. So, in other words, the map of the world, the map of Mundi, so to speak, quotes from this text in its description of what's on that island. And this is the result. Um, here is the triangle where this thing can be seen. And that thing about the, must reflect that if you climb the crags of this mountain, you see the ribs of this boat against the sky, which have been there since the ark landed all that time before, and everything's been eaten except the, the framework. And there it is, um, like a great camel skeleton, so to speak, in the desert. And we can tell that it is this triangle here, which is the one that's meant. Now, this is really something rather interesting for the following reason. Um, it's because of finding Miss Horsley's fragment that the text on the back could be interpreted, to establish that that went there, and therefore this was this one, that we now know that that was, in the Babylonian perception, about 1800 BC, the mountain beyond the edge of the world where Atrahasis' boat came to rest. Now, if you come down off this mountain and you cross the water, the first area inside the known world that's to be encountered is Urartu. And Urartu is the ancient Assyrian name for Armenia. And the Urartaeans are very warlike and a pain in the neck for the Assyrians, and they had many altercations with them. And we know that Urartu means Armenia in the modern sense of the world. And this is where the lunacy about Mount Ararat comes into sharp and unmistakable clarity. A. Mount Ararat is in Turkey. B. Ararat is not the ancient name. C. The name of the mountain in the Bible is not Mount Ararat. It is, it says, it came to rest among the mountains of Ararat which is like saying in the Alps and not on the Alp. So Mount Ararat in Turkey, which is a modern name, has nothing to do with the Ark, whether or not the Ark ever existed. Interesting point? Get it? Whether or not there ever was Noah's Ark, it was never on Mount Ararat in Turkey. But what we can say with the benefit of this document, is that when our tablet was written and when it was quoted from, the Babylonians believed that the mountain where that boat came to rest was, you go up to Armenia, up to Urartu, and then it's off in that direction. So when the Judeans heard the story in Babylon, and they were told that um, where did the ark came, come from? Oh, beyond the mountains of Urartu, beyond the mountains of Urartu. In the Hebrew, it came out as the mountains of Ararat because none of them had ever been anywhere near anywhere like that. It's like asking people who live in Potter's Bar about the Isle of Lewis. And there you are. So this explains with the typical example of the way really important things get buggered up by people who don't know anything about languages. It is not Mount Ararat, it is the mountains of Ararat, which is the mountains of Urartu, which is the mountains of Armenia, and there it is on the map, and there is our ark, because it quotes from my tablet. So there. <laughs> and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you.